Hi, my name is Argonaut and today we'll look at how exactly does an exchange work and more specifically how exactly does the matching engine work. As some of you may know that are following me on Twitch on twitch.tv slash ArgonautDev, I'm working on my own exchange in C++ while uh, streaming on Twitch. Also, since we're already talking about my socials, I've started the Discord. You can get the invite link in the description down below. Now, I'm gonna use my own stock exchange and how I've implemented it as an example as to how it could work. So this is just kind of a simplification of how it works, but it does the same thing. So it still works for the theory of stuff. You've probably already heard of stocks, maybe even futures and options. You've probably seen the graphs like this on Google or <laughs> this on Wall Street Bets. And some of you maybe even have started trading yourself. But if you do, most of you will be trading through something that we call a broker. So something like Robinhood. You do not have direct access to an exchange as an individual. Now an exchange in its most simplified, boiled down form is just a couple of server racks somewhere in a data center running the matching engine. Some companies can then rent out server racks in the vicinity of the matching engine and then connect to it with equal length cables. How exactly the racks are arranged or the switches or how these connections work, the technical sophistication, even the protocol, everything like that can differ from exchange to exchange. Now let's say we wanted to sell some Tesla stock because Michael Burry predicted the 20th recession in the last six years. So we go to the exchange and we look at its current order book. When it comes to actually making a trade, you don't just go to Google, see the graph and then buy or sell a stock. You actually always need a counterparty who is willing to trade with you at the agreed price. So if you want to buy something, there has to be someone there willing to sell it to you at that price at that specific moment for exactly that volume. And this is why we have the order book. Now I'm going to go down and actually draw some stuff. So when we look at this, an order book is nothing more than a representation of all the current orders that are present in the exchange for a given instrument. So here in the middle, we can see the price of the instrument. On the left, we can see what we call the bids meaning people are willing to buy at that price. And on the right, we can see the asks, meaning people are willing to sell. The difference between the lowest ask and the highest bid is what we call the spread. So in this example, we would have a spread of two cents. Generally in very liquid markets, you have spreads that are very, very small, a couple of cents, maybe even one cent for like stuff like the S&P. But the less liquid they are, the bigger the spread. Also the more volatile the market, the bigger the spread. The number next to the price, in this example, let's look at the bits. So this 500 at 185.05 means that there are 500 lots available there to be sold or in another term, someone there or multiple people together create a volume of 500 stocks that they want to buy at that very price. The same thing obviously then holds for the asks, just vice versa. So if we want to sell some stock right now in this very moment, I would have to put in an order, an ask order, so we are willing to sell at a price of 185.05 to hit that bit and cross the spread. Now crossing the spread basically means just going through this, this gap, this one, two, two cent gap to hit another bit. Because there are only 500 lots available at that price, in this very moment we can only sell 500 lots at this price. Now we say there are 500 lots bid at 185.05 but we don't actually know if this is one person with a 500 lot order or if these are five people with a 100 lot order each. Now let's say I want to sell to them 200 lots of Tesla stock. Who actually gets 
these trades. For this, the most common method is price time priority. There is also pro rata, but it's less common, so I'm not gonna go into it now. In price time priority, as the name suggests, the first thing to be checked is the price. So whoever has the highest bid when I want to sell is going to get the trade. If at that price, let's say 185.05, there are five people willing to buy the person that was there first gets the trade so in this example if there are five people with a hundred lots each and i sell 200 lots the two people that came first with that price will get the trade so if you look at that how i actually implemented this in the actual code it is quite trivial once you know these constraints so let's say there is an order that comes in an ask of 200 lots at 185.05. When that comes into our system, what we have to do is look at the current order book, which basically consists of two ordered sets. We have one set for the bids, which is sorted in descending order, and we have one set for the asks which is sorted in ascending order this allows us to basically loop through this set and then always get the best bits or the best asks as we go up and continue matching an order this individual elements in this set is what we call a level so a price is basically the same thing as a level because you would move level by level to match an order. So if this ask comes in, we would loop through the bit set and then check the first element against the price, see if it's either less than or equal as the price, and then we start matching. Now each level consists of a doubly linked list of orders. This is to fulfill the time constraint. When an order comes in, it is placed at the end of the doubly linked list. And if we start matching, we go from the, from the head to the tail. So whenever we start matching the orders, we actually go in order of time when they came into the matching engine. Now let's walk through it in its entirety with the 200 lots ask example to make sure that it makes sense. Since it's an ask order, we look at our set with the ordered bids. We start iterating over it, getting the first level at 185.05, meaning the highest price for the bids. We compare the price of that level with our order and see that it is equal. Hence, we found the first level that fulfills the price constraint. We then look at the doubly linked list in that level and start walking it. We find the first node, consisting of an order at that price with 800 lots. So we match that making a trade of volume 100, completely filling that bit and removing it from the list. But we still have 100 volume left on our ask. Hence, we keep walking the doubly linked list to the next node. The next node is again another order at volume 100. So we match against that as well, making another trade, filling both orders, the existing bit and our new ask that came in. So so we can stop the matching process altogether, report all of these trades and remove those orders from the order book. The book is then in a new state that I will depict here and we can see that the volume on the bid side is now 200 lots less. Now there are two things to mention here. The reason why we iterate through the levels instead of just taking the top one and start matching immediately is that someone could put in an ask with a volume of a thousand with a price of 100, meaning that this person is willing to sell all of this volume at whatever price up until 100, which means we might need to match his order against multiple levels to fill the volume. Another thing to mention is that you've hopefully realized until now that the matching engine has to run in a synchronous fashion, at least per instrument. These orders and these trades have to happen in an atomic fashion. If a trade comes in, it has to have an order book where it can do its thing, go to a new state, 
and then return for the next order to come in without any weird interleavings where we have multiple trades happening, negative volumes, whatever multi-threading could do to you. <laughs> now we've always mentioned orders as, as if they were like this one singular thing, but actually there are multiple types of orders and it consists of quite a bit of data. So let's go through the most frequent things that you need to know. Now an order consists of, well, as I said, a lot of things, but we'll focus on the more important parts. It consists of the symbol ID, which is basically the ID of the instrument that we are trying to trade. Then we have order type and order lifetime, which we'll get into in a second. We have the order side, which could be either a bid or an ask. We have the price, which is the price, and the volume of the order. Now let's dig deeper into the order type. The types for an order is a market order, a limit order, a fill or kill, immediate or cancel, stop market, stop limit, quote. Those are the most common ones, but we will even limit this list a little bit more and discuss only a couple of them. Let's start off with the market order. A market order is basically an order that has no price. We want to just fulfill our volume at whatever price there is. This is a very, very risky order. That is why a lot of uh, actual like trading companies would not use it, but a lot of the retail investors will because they just want to get their one or two lots out and they want to hold it for a long time anyway, so it doesn't matter. This means if I put a volume of 1000 with a market order, then it will just fill wherever it goes. A limit order on the other hand, like the name suggests, has a limit when it comes to the price. So if I put in a bid at a price 100, means that I am willing to buy at the price 100 or below. The reason why we say below is when another order comes in to sell, let's say price 50, this would still match with us selling to us at a price 100. We don't get it for 50, we get it for 100, but we match with another order that was willing to sell at 50. The fill or kill on the other hand is a little bit more interesting. It means we put in an order that has a certain price and volume, and only if the entire volume can be satisfied at that given price, will the order actually execute. Otherwise, it gets canceled. The immediate or cancel, on the other hand, is a little bit different, where it would just try and execute whatever volume there is, and whatever is not fulfilled will get canceled. So you can get partial fills. Hey, webcam Argonaut here. Just wanted to do very quickly interject and say that the one order out of the four that we've mentioned here, the limit order, is the only order where the order will stay in the order book even if it is not fully filled. So if you have a limit order with 200 lots, and not all of the 200 lots, so only 100 lots get filled, the remaining 100 will remain in the book so someone else can hit it and then you can make the trade. The other three that I've mentioned will not remain in the book. Just wanted to mention that. The other ones are less important, so I'm gonna skip them for now. Let's move back to the order lifetime. There are generally three types of lifetime. We have good for day, good till date, and good till cancel. Now they're very, very self-explanatory, so I'm just gonna go through them very quickly. Good for day means this order is gonna stay good for the entire day. At the end of day, which you realize stock markets are open usually just for a couple hours a day, these orders will get canceled. So on the next day, the order book will not have these orders in. Good till date is the same thing, but for a specific date. And good till cancel means it just stays alive until it either gets filled or it gets canceled. Now with all of these things covered, you have a bigger picture of how an exchange actually works, how a matching engine works, what they do, what it doesn't do. And now with this in mind, in future videos, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper into specific sections of this exchange, as well as discuss them with the actual source code as, and all of that good stuff. If you're interested in this, please leave a comment telling me exactly what you're more interested in, what you would like to see next, and I'll go into that a bit more in detail. Thank you very much. This was Argonaut from Argonaut Developments. See you next time.